Probably one of the most inspirational moments in human history was the landing on the moon by Apollo 11 and Neil Armstrong's first steps onto the surface. But maybe if Project A119 had gone ahead almost 10 years earlier, things might not have looked quite so rosy, knowing that the US and possibly the Soviets had already used the moon as a nuclear testing ground to basically show clever they were to the rest of the world and to intimidate each other with who's got the biggest and most powerful and accurate missiles. So just what was Project A119 and the later to be famous person that worked on it and inadvertently revealed the top secret program? This video is sponsored by NordVPN. As the Cold War progressed in the late 1950s and the Soviets took the lead when they put Sputnik 1 into orbit around the Earth on October the 4th, 1957, then just four weeks later, on November the 3rd, Sputnik 2 carried like of a dog into orbit, the shock to the US was palpable. If the Soviets could carry a satellite around the world with either a radio transmitter or a dog on board, then it could do the same with a nuclear weapon and place it anywhere on US soil within an hour. This was exactly the message the Soviets wanted to send and now it was up to the US to try and show that they could do the same. But the rumour mill was already running at full steam before Sputnik 2 was even launched. On November 1st, 1957, just over three weeks after Sputnik 1, the Pittsburgh Press ran an article in which it claimed that the US intelligence services believed that the Soviets were going to explode a hydrogen bomb on the moon on November the 7th, which would also be the 40th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. And they would announce this ahead of time so that the whole world could watch. In the article, they went on to say that although they didn't think they could do it on the first try, the fear was that the guidance system wouldn't be accurate enough to place it on the terminator line, that's the part between the light and dark part of the moon, so that it would show up more than the brightly lit surface of the full moon on November the 7th. They claimed that if it missed the moon and went wide, it could slingshot around the back of the moon and head back to Earth, H-bomb and all. To top it all off, at the same time, President Eisenhower was given a report saying that the US had fallen well behind the Soviets in missile technology, the so-called missile gap. And to push the point home of how advanced the Soviet Premier Khrushchev believed his rockets were over the Americans, he challenged the US to a peaceful missile shooting match. After the very public televised failure of the first US satellite attempt with Vanguard TV3 on the 6th of December 1957, and then the failure of its backup in February 1958, the US eventually placed Vanguard 1 into orbit on March of the same year. However, over the next year, six out of the eight following Vanguard missions failed, and the US was very much on the back foot. So, quite amazingly, with this track record in mind, officers from the US Air Force approached Dr. Leonard Riefel, a senior physicist at NASA, and asked him if it could be possible to detonate a nuclear weapon on the moon as a morale booster for the US public and to show the US's technological prowess to the Soviets and to the rest of the world. After being intrigued by the Air Force's request, in 1958, Riefel put together a 10-member team which included Gerald Kuiper, the man who the Kuiper belt is named after, and a PhD student of his, a 24-year-old Carl Sagan. Together, the team looked at how they could get a warhead to the moon and what the effects of a nuclear blast on it would be, including things like seismic shock and the possibility of radioactive dust making its way back to the Earth. They also looked at the effect on any biological life, even though it was thought to be highly unlikely there was any on the moon anyway, and also the radioactive fallout that would come back to the surface. And this was one of the jobs which Carl Sagan was tasked with. Initially, the scientists wanted to use a hydrogen bomb of around one megaton, 
but that was deemed too heavy for the launch vehicle, though what rocket they would have used was not specified, but it was believed to have been one of the Air Force's ICBMs that would have been in service by 1959. So in the end, a small device of around 1.7 kilotons, around about a tenth of the power of the Hiroshima bomb was proposed. However, that's as far as it got, as in 1959 the Air Force cancelled the project out of fear of a bad public reaction and the thought of what might happen if the rocket failed during the launch or it missed the moon and ended up coming back to the Earth, much like they thought the Soviet one might do. The signing of the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1963 and the Outer Space Treaty in 1967 put paid to any further ideas of nuking the moon, even though it was still suggested in 1969 by a scientist for seismic work to discover the makeup of the moon's core. That idea was also dropped. Now the project remained a secret up until the late 1990s when the writer Kay Davidson was researching the life of Carl Sagan for a biography. It was during this that he discovered that Sagan had included details of the project in an academic scholarship application. Even though it was classified, he had inadvertently revealed a top secret project. The publication of the book Carl Sagan A Life and the public interest in it led to a freedom of information request and the release of the only document left on Project A119, which is called A Study of Lunar Research Flights Volume 1, which we have shown here and you can download from a link in the description. There are up to eight other documents, but they were all destroyed during the 1980s. And so what about the Soviets? Well, they did plan to detonate a nuclear weapon on the moon around 1959, but it seems they arrived at pretty much the same conclusion as the US, and that it wasn't worth the bad press and the risk of something going wrong. Now, keeping things secret online now is a problem for everyone, especially when it comes to things like online banking and personal emails, etc. And this is something I take very seriously as well, which is why I use NordVPN. Now, part of my job entails a lot of research online, and sometimes I'm directed to websites which aren't always what they seem. And this is where you really need something to help you out before you fall into one of these traps. Using a VPN hides your computer's real IP address to make it much more difficult for hackers to gain access to any potential personal data like passwords, bank logins, etc. And now with NordVPN's new CyberSec security built right into the app, you'll also be protected from websites that are known to host things like phishing, malware, trackers and the like by blocking them before they can infect your computer. Now this month Nord is celebrating its 8th birthday, so not only can you get the 3 year plan plus 70% off and 1 month free on top of that, as part of our celebrations Nord will be giving surprise gifts to their customers. Now you can get all this by using the coupon code CuriousDroid at the address now shown and there's even a 30 day money back guarantee so there's no excuse for not trying it out.